Hans Wollenweider, uh, a physician from the University of Zurich who does neuroimaging work. Franz's presentation is called Neuro Neuronal Network and Neurotransmitter Dynamics, Underlying Psychedelic-Induced Altered States of Consciousness in Humans. With that uh, in mind, I'm going to turn you over to Franz. Um, and if the Thank you. Help me welcome Franz. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I wish first to thank Neil for his kind invitation to give a lecture here. Uh, this fascinating audience, and uh, it was also a great pleasure to see old friends, which I haven't seen for years. Normally, the Americans come to Switzerland to bring in new ideas. Now we come back and say how it goes. So the hospital I work on is the Psychiatric University Hospital of Zurich and it's called the Buchholzli. It has three different famous children. One was Bleuler, who introduced the term schizophrenia. He was the first who coined the term and uh, described the illness. The second was Carl Jung, who just was in the house as LSD jumped in. And the third was certainly LSD. So, yeah, some are very child, some are happy, wonderful child. You can see as you want it. I want to give you a short historical remark about uh, what we do in our clinic or what we have done. So, Hoffman, Swiss chemist, uh, came over LSD in about 38, but before he was working in the field of cardiovascular enhancing substances like mesogyne. And mesogyne was certainly one of the first of his compounds that has been marketed. And there were a number of others like Hydrogen, Dehydrogen, Barlodale, it's all Swiss names, but uh, he was one of the most successful chemists and uh, Novartis nowadays and previous Sondo made about 400 to 600 millions per compound per year. So Stoll was the first who studied LSD in uh, our clinic with Kondrau and at those times they studied the effect of these compounds in depressed patients and then, then went on to schizophrenia, but this wasn't so successful, like, uh, for instance, uh, people that suffered from a kind of neurosis or anxiety. Another guy, Hyman, started to work with hydroxy-LSD in about the 60s, and then 58, uh, Hoffman uh, was success, uh, had successfully uh, synthesized and uh, describes psilocybin, and it has been studied by Kniers. Another compound that uh, was found in, in Zurich was Massimo, it was extracted by Oxter and studied by my previous boss, Xu Longst. And then there was a huge area of big uh, experimental phases that uh, had been driven by Dietrich. Dietrich was a German psychologist who came to Zurich for 10 years and uh, founded with Hoffman and Leuner, we heard about Leuner from Bill Richards this morning, uh, the ECBS, the European uh, Forum or Society for the Study of Consciousness. So we hope that this uh, and, um, society may help to uh, accelerate uh, the process uh, to use psychedelics. I jumped in um, in 1990 and started the first time doing brain imaging of these compounds. And the idea was to convince mainstream science you have to come up with hard facts, with numbers and all this, what's needed nowadays to bring in a compound on the market. It's a long way and uh, it's already not uh, makeable uh, for single institutes. In 1998, uh, I started a collaboration with the Hefty Research Center, and we established a whole lab. With now there are about 20 people working in the lab, um, about 12 in psychedelics in basic research, and about 10 more into uh, clinical application and schizophrenia and depression. Albert passed away in 2008, but research is still going on now. Why do we study these compounds? We are interested uh, to use th these compounds as tools to study modifications of consciousness. Naturally, we are also interested to study consciousness 
per se, or the code, how is consciousness implemented in science or in the brain or in any material. We don't know and we think we don't have the answer. So we are more modest and try to understand the correlates of consciousness. How does psilocybin or LSD or mescaline modify perception, mood, unconscious processing and so on. We also study these states in relation to dreams, dream research or natural occurring psychosis to make, to make the distinction what's similar in these states with an illness, what's not similar. And then there are some people in our lab that are more interested in spiritual developments and clinical applications, but we just jump into the clinical applications. We do now, since 10 years, mostly basic research to have a handle to know more about these drugs. Now, I don't have to give a definition about psychedelics, but in, as a technical term, we speak about hallucinogens. Even They do not even produce always hallucinations, but it's just a misnomer, and it goes back to the pharmacological uh, description of these drugs. Now, there are several families, these hallucinogens, and today I want to speak more a little bit about uh, the classic ones, and uh, unfortunately I don't have a pointer, but you can see on the right side, they're all similar in the structure. A molecule has a structure, has a form, and the form has to fit in like a key in a lock, and the lock are the receptors on the neurons in the brain. There's a basic pharmacological principle, and if the form is different, the key may not fit, but it still goes in and makes a modification of a neural process. And what you can see here are the very famous one on the right side, psilocybin, has the same structure like LSD. If you look at the bottom, similar compounds we can find in toads. And these are the so-called uh, classic serotonergic hallucinogens. The other ones in between is mescaline. It has quite a different structure but also the ring structure fits into the same receptor. Then there are the phenylethylamines, about 200, mostly done by Alexander Shulgin. And then there are others, like we call them secondary hallucinogens, these are anesthetics, and if you take a tenth of a normal clinical dose, you can induce a similar state like serotonergic hallucinogens. There is an overlap, it's not completely the same. And in the end, for instance, Massimo goes back to the Soma, which is described in the Vedas, we think so. At least Gordon Rosson pushed that idea, uh, has a completely different structure and uh, just completely different things in the brain. Now, what was the first questions we had some years ago? In 1976, Dietrich came up with the idea, based on the literature, that these drugs may induce similar alterations, even there are different inducers. And he did a huge experimental study involving about 400 norm normal volunteers, and he has used different inducers. Then the study has been replicated in the, in the 80s with uh, a number of European countries. So what was his finding? He said, at the basis of yourself, you have something like an ego, a construct, or the self, even the self is also a construct, a concept, there's no self in the brain. We cannot find a self if you look with the camera into the brain. And he used hallucinogens on the one side, he used sensory deprivation like the samadhi tank, he used sensory overload, and he used people that did a lot of meditation. And he, his question was, what is the main dimension? How can we come down on a scientific basis to describe the psychological alterations and he used these classical rating scales and developed a specific one, the so-called ASC rating scale. One dimension was he labeled according to the findings oceanic boundlessness, if it's fully ex uh, expressed, we heard it from Bill Richards, it's more a mystical state, oneness, unity. The other one is more the anxious ego dissolution that's more linked to what you would say, it's a psychotic state, similar to a, a schizophrenic uh, exacerbation. And the third one he labeled the vision, the visionary experience, the imaginary, the 
including hallucinations and illusions. So he had another a number of little sub-dimensions, but this was his basic concept. And as I entered the institute, I had asked the question, can we find neuronal correlates? Can we use the state-of-the-art technology like fMRI, brain imaging, PET scans, EEG, can we tease out this dimension, which are in every culture the same? I don't speak about the content, I speak about basic dimensions. Now we just reanalyzed uh, one cohort of our recent studies we have done in the last six years. So it includes 600 subjects. We used 96 items, visual analog scales, you make a scratch. Is it more than normal, is it less? And we used a Dietrich scale, like uh, including this oceanic boundlessness, all the time sense, all the uh, experience of the ego boundaries, feeling of oneness, religious exaltation, then visionary re restructuralization, or just vision means uh, uh, illusions, hallucinations, changing of the meaning of the percepts, and we also used the third dimension to look what's similar with a psychotic state, anxiety, panic, and so on. But we came up with another two dimensions, acoustic alterations is this thing that can happen on its own and changes in vigilance, in awareness. So we included in the study 300 subjects with psilocybin, 160 with ketamine, 100 with MDMA, having different doses, small, middle, high doses. And the trick is we put them, some of them through brain imaging, some through psychological testing, and we wanted to find out first, can we find Dietrich's dimension? Then we wanted to know how, uh, what happens in the brain when people have, let's say, hallucinations or visions, however you label that. And uh, Eric, one of my students, came up with a more complex result. He did not end up with six dim uh, three dimensions. We found, in fact, five main dimensions like oceanic boundlessness, visionary experience, uh, anxiety, and uh, anxious ego dissolution, acoustic alterations, and all these main dimensions have sub-dimensions like uh, noetic consciousness, deeply positive mood, uh, loss of ego boundaries, unity, so I don't want to go into the details, but from a mathematical point of view, we can now demonstrate and use this scale, this scale has 96 items, and to do further study. And it's strongly validated in, 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 in 1,700 single trials we have done in these six years. Uh, I don't think we do more, uh, but we go on. But if you come up with these numbers, it's easy to convince the government and uh, the people that are responsible because you can describe what we can expect from a psychological point of view. And here, you can see it really good, but what we show here is the dose response. You see on the right side, low dose, a little higher. The more you give, the stronger the effect. But this is not the whole story because there are a number of other predictors that predict these developments of these dimensions. For instance, optimistic extroversion has a positive influence of the uh, development of more an ecstatic state, or for instance, non-dogmatic re religiosity, or this activity, previous experience, setting, has some influence, and naturally the dose. For the anxiety, the development of a bad trip, the most the strongest predictor was emotional liability, rigid conventionality. And this is important to know when you go into patients, you have first to screen them, where are they with their emotional balance and so on, what can you expect? As a divisionary experience, we can more or less predict based on a number of factors before we put people in an experiment. <coughs> There's also a time course, just an example over the time from uh, one to six hours, you see emotional excitation goes up, goes down, and this stuff is also dose dependent. A more interesting, fascinating thing was to demonstrate how many people develop a bad trip. And this is in the middle here, anxious ego dissolution. They were only about 4% in a clinical 
environment where we know the dose, where we know we have a nice setting, it's not just a research setting, there are <coughs> flowers and seeds and pictures on the wall, <coughs> there is music, and certainly we test the people, let's say, for 15 to 30 minutes in a brain scan, but the whole environment is so constructed that even in the brain scan area, it's uh, a nice atmosphere. And if all this is uh, really set, then there's not much to say in the case, for instance, here with psilocybin up to 0.3 milligrams per kilo. When you go up a little more, 0.4, what uh, Griffiths and uh, Bill Richards used, then you can expect more anxiety, as they showed maybe up to 30%, up from 10 to 30, because the dose goes tremendously up. But for many applications, the doses we studied are uh, enough to do psycholytic therapy. Now, it comes the hard part. I want to show you a little bit more uh, what we do with science, because uh, I'm fascinated by these drugs because they are the most wonderful tools to study how the brain works. And a normal brain has about a hundred millions of millions of neurons, so we can hardly understand the network. And each neuron has about 10,000 interactions. And at each uh, neuron to the next, uh, there are millions of transmitters, uh, brain chemicals, that communicate with each other. So how can we do that? We use, as said, for instance, fMRI or PET scan, positron emission tomography. And here on the left side, you see a neuron. And the neuron that it can work needs energy glucose or uh, any other compound uh, and we can label, we can use glucose and add a little compound that emits or gives free positrons, light particles. The stuff goes into the blood vessels, goes up into the brain and in the brain if we have a decay of this positron into two light particles and if they hit the detectors within less than a billionth of a second, then it's a, a, an event and this is registered by the computer and we can back calculate where does it come from. So I don't want to go on all the techniques, but we can quantify the activity of the brain in each little cube and we can measure how much psilocybin or whatever is in the brain through this kind of chemistry. So the other is we can use uh, measure brain waves with 200 electrodes. It's, it's, not, it's not invasive. It's just uh, stick it a little bit on the head with a cap. And we can calculate uh, where are the generators in the brain that this uh, electric activity is uh, based on and we can make slices through the brain and look in the three-dimensional step uh, and in the time resolution where comes the information from. Now I speak a little bit about psilocybin and I want to show you three different things. On the left side, these are activity patterns. You see the frontal cortex, little orange, uh, red, and the back is more blue. The left side is activation, the blue is deactivation. Then I will speak a little bit about receptors. Where does psilocybin stick to? What are the proteins? And on the right side, uh, there is more electrical dynamics. So first, we were very, uh, 10 years ago, as we did the first psilocybin studies, we were very surprised what these drugs do. They tremendously activate frontal cortical areas which are highly linked, as we understand that, to the ego, to structures that help to form you a transient ego feeling and a body boundary. And you see a little bit on the right side the blue bubbles, and these are responsible to give you information how is the environment in relation to your body. But these areas are shut down, they are blue, but the ego in the front is markedly activated with a number of other areas. It's, it's a complex network. But what I want to make the point is that internally, areas or brain regions that are responsible for unity are much more active than in normal states. 
and the relation to the external world is shut down for specific information, not for everything. You have the impression on the trip, everything is so brilliant, so uh, intense, but it's just information that does not normally come into consciousness. So the other thing I want to show you, this is are the regions that are responsible for this ecstatic state. The blue ones is the shutdown from the amygdala, regions that are highly responsible for anxiety. They go down in the ecstatic state, others go up. Areas like the hippocampus lights up, it's important for memory, so you have more access to past experiences. This is quite a different state. You see only two things, a shutdown of the frontal cortex blue and a lighting up of some central areas like the thalamus. This is a more psychotic state. It's more panic and anxiety, so we can differentiate its dimensions. The next thing here is we can travel through the brain nowadays with computers. We make these measurements. But what you see here on the, this red, it, go, it goes from the bottom up to the top. Yellow and red and green, these aren't the binding signs. Where does psilocybin or LSD, all these drugs, stick to? And on the left side, we see the blue bars and the red bars, and the difference is the occupancy or occupancy, how much psilocybin is in a brain area. And that when we have a strong uh, occupancy in the frontal area, or see on the right side, then we have this ecstatic state. So we can also quantify. Uh, this stuff. And it goes a step further. I didn't, this is just static, what I explained now, but what we have is these brain areas are interrelated and they communicate very fast, thousand times per second, for instance, even faster. And these psychedelics, they alter the dynamics between the regions also, that are not just more active or less active, but the dynamics between these areas are changed. So what you see here, if it works, some wobbling, it does not really uh, move. But this is a typical illusion, it's not a hallucination. There is a stimulus outside in the world and you see it change, it should uh, move. But it, maybe it does not. Here are some pictures that people show after they we have measured them. And what you see here is, as it is, simple geometric elementary hallucinations or, or things they see or imaginaries, often tunnels, spirals, and this is transcultural. We, we have seen that uh, there's French people, Swiss people, German people, it doesn't matter. This was a, another guy has also this, this vision, so it's interesting. And we had asked, uh, how does this happen? Here, more complex, we call that organic hallucinations, animals, cells, here a scenery, uh, a kind of angel is the death, rebirth thing, the embryo, the flowers, life cycle. This was a very nice student of biology who was skillful in drawing all thousands of details. Really nice um, subject in the study. So how does this <coughs> happen? If people have imaginary, have inner visions, you see on the left side, just another activation pattern. These are visual areas that are normally involved in processing what that is happening now when you see me, these areas get activated. So it's interesting that even this subject have their eyes closed, the normal modules in the brain that are needed for hearing, for vision, are activated by these drugs. Here is <coughs> most sophisticated version you see these red bubbles in the frontal areas, and we can do everything nowadays with the brain or on a computer with these numbers. Just to visualize, the frontal cortex is shut down, who normally is involved in execu executed functioning in making decisions and all that stuff, shut down. But the blue areas, the visual system is highly working in these uh, visionary states. <coughs> go to the next. So, to get more information about the dynamics, we use brain waves. Brain waves, looking at brain waves and ending up with the same three-dimensional analysis of data has an advantage because we can now 
have a look into the communication of brain areas, and we have a high time resolution. We shot about uh, a thousand pictures per second, even a little more in this uh, experiment. Here, just <coughs> one thing I want to show you. You see on the left side, we call that Canisa figures as a stimulus. And you can't see a lot, but if I turn it a little around, you see a triangle, and you see illusionary contours. We call that object completion. Your brain has to fill in something that does not exist. And this is a little model to study what is the brain doing when you have visionary experiences, something gets created back from memory, from archetypes, and so on. And we were asking, where is that stuff happening in the brain? And if you give a stimulus, the upper curve, placebo, nothing happens. If you give a low dose psilocybin on, on the right side, uh, a higher dose, we see that after 170 milliseconds, after we give a visual stimulus, the brain starts, uh, you see the difference, uh, processing this visual stimuli different. The brain is constantly active. This is uh, a very rough picture. As it comes, this is the magnetic field. The brain, when you sit here now, does this a thousand times a second. And we call this microstates. And we have mathematical tools to analyze these microstates. If you give a stimulus on the left side and you see this sweep, the red is placebo, sugar, the black one is psilocybin, and the whole range is 300 milliseconds. It's not a second, it's a third of a sec. And now we can follow that visual processing. And what's the interesting thing is that psilocybin takes away the information that comes into the brain and generates the information within the brain. So on the right side, you see that in terms of microstates. And we can read out this pattern. And as a we hope so that I can show you the dynamics of this. And on the right side, you see the more people, the stronger they have the experience of visions, the more specific brain areas get activated. And now here is the, dyna the dynamics. This is a third of a second, and you see how the information wanders through the brain, comes up to the visual area, now puff, and now subject have this vision. And it goes away after a few milliseconds, and new cycles come in. It's, it's not, uh, you cannot see it really here because uh, it's too light. But what I want to show you, how far we are nowadays, a third of a sec, and we map out the whole path, what's going on in this brain, just as an uh, uh, example. Now I want to go to more uh, other thoughts we have. Often you have uh, perceptual rivalry. For instance, you see a vase or a face. You cannot decide on that. Your subconscious does this for you, and it's a cycle. Normally every second or 1.2 second, your brain makes a decision, or your consciousness, whatever you label that stuff. Something in you makes a decision. Now I see the face, I see the vase. Okay. Uh, here is something more complex. This is a, a ball rolling, and everybody of you sees that. And if you really relax, then something may happen. Maybe it turns upside down, it changes. I don't know whether you got it. It's a little too light here. It should be darker. Is somebody here that it switches? It goes like, OK. If everybody of you would tap, everybody's different. Your brain constructs this reality, very similar to a trip. There's nothing. The computer, there's no uh, turning bowl, or I call that uh, a world, or whatever you see. It just light flashes, but you have the impression it turns, and it goes up and goes down. And this is completely managed by your subconsciousness. You have no access to that. You can train as much as you want, and everybody has his cycle and his face. OK, we used that and thought it's a nice thing to see uh, what this psilocybin doing on such things coming from the subconsciousness. We do it a little bit more complex. We give people a goggle, and uh, through one eye, 
they look on a projector, they see a grid. One eye gets horizontal information, the other gets uh, vertical information, and they see the grid once horizontal, once uh, vertical. And everybody has its rhythm, and on the right side you see the rhythm. Uh, 1.5 second is the highest peak, is the switching rate for horizontal, and the other one, uh, the vertical, is about the same. But it's never exactly the same. It's a distribution. Once it's a sec, once 1.2 sec, 1.3, 1.4. So that's the normal state. You switch always, and every person has such a pattern. So look on the left side. You, on the top is placebo. Now we give in psilocybin. And you see how the brain comes in a tuned fashion. So they're absolutely stable. On the right side, we went uh, to India, and uh, we had the luck that the Dalai Lama was several times in Zurich, and we had asked him, give us the best uh, meditators. And they got the goggles, and uh, what you see, they can do that without psilocybin. So the next question for us would be, what's behind that? Who is tiring this, all that? And it's a long way to go up there. Just an example, uh, an interesting example, how these drugs influence subconscious processing. And now we are certainly interested to find out uh, what's going on in the brain to use that for the future. It's no end in sight. Uh, he pushes me to finish, I understand him. The last thing is just to show you this, these drugs, they hook up on the neurons and specific receptors. You see here, there are many, many serotonin receptors, 12, and psilocybin just takes out one, the 2A receptor, and here is a model from Dave Nichols who made that for us. And it is because psilocybin is so similar to the brain neurotransmitter serotonin. But only one receptor has to be stimulated. If we block this receptor, what you see on the left side, there will be no effect. Now you can ask, MDMA or ecstasy also stimulates the serotonin system, but it does not produce the psychedelic effects. Here, on the left side is an image, subject on the MDMA, right psilocybin, it's quite a different thing. Both stimulate the serotonin, but only one receptor, the 2A, is responsible. Now it's the last the news, then I'll stop. What we found last year, and a group here at the Mount Sinai Hospital with whom we collaborate, these drugs do something in the cell, in the neuron. They change the secondary pathway. Serotonin does this not. MDMA does it, does it not. Here on the right side, you can see only LSD, psilocybin, DOM, but not MDMA, produce very specific alterations in the pathway in the neuron. So that's the future. And we can learn a lot about that because when we understand that, we can also develop new compounds to block the effects, and something we are running for. We use the psychedelics to understand the brain and consciousness, and we try to use it in patients, but I didn't speak about that. But we can also learn a lot about how the brain works, and uh, we can find blockers of hallucinations, and that's the way we make the money. So, okay. I have to thank a lot of students. I had the privilege to know Albert Hoffman for 30 years. Every year we had sessions in his house. He taught our students first-hand knowledge. And so I wish you lots of success in the States with that kind of research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rollenweider. I hate being the bad cop, but in the interest of everyone else's talks, I, 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 I sacrifice and do that. Uh, we have some time for Q&A for open discussion. I want to know if you have personal experience with psychedelics. Have you taken them personally? And if so, do they help with your research? My researchers. Your research? they have personal experiences. OK, but do you yourself? Have you taken psychedelics? <laughs> What do you think uh, was the starting point to do all that? <laughs> well, do you think it's important for people who do research 
yeah, uh, so with our, psychedelics to have. We have the privilege that we can do training sessions. Most of the people in the lab uh, go regularly through new drugs and experiences. Before we put people in a scanner, we do it ourselves to tease out, to find out, is it, uh, can they bear that? Is, is, is it too much or is it, is it okay? So the question is, it's done, isn't it? Okay. Hi. Uh, there was a lot of information there, and I'm not sure yes, I absorbed it, was it all. Stress, I know. But <laughs> um, earlier in the talk, I think you were talking about predictors of whether somebody's psychedelic experience would be associated with a lot of anxiety. I, I'm not sure that's was. Were you talking about that? Yes, just as uh, shortly. Briefly. Briefly. Uh, we are running for the predictors. We found some for anxiety and panic. Uh, so th this seems like a pretty critical question to me because. It, you know, I think there's a, some subset of the population that gets a lot out of these experiences, and maybe another subset that absolutely would not, yes. <laughs> and should be encouraged to not do it. But only if the, I mean, if there are predictors that will give us information on that along those lines, I think they're very important. So what, can you summarize again what the predictors are, whether somebody might have a good experience? At the publication, you will find it uh, sooner. It's, it's going out as publication. But what, you have, what we have done is we have published a paper now, uh, there are also, this is more complex, there are also polymorphism of the 2A receptors. That means not all people have the same 2A receptor where psilocybin or LSD goes to. Some have little conformationary alterations. We call that polymorphism, genetic traits. And what we found on published now is that the 25% of normal subjects have this other 2A form of receptor. And the guys who have that form, they have uh, a problem to gate external stimuli. They get overwhelmed by external stimuli. And uh, there are, in fact, two publications on that. So it will come up much more complex to find predictors for these states. And you c cannot predict everything. Predictor means that, let's say, in 80%, people may react like that. Uh, but I would like to ask uh, if you could comment a little bit on the distinction of uh, research with humans and with animals, because like given the, the mind altering and, and consciousness, consciousness effects of psychedelics, mm -hmm. uh, many people think uh, animal research in this field is not really useful. So if you could comment a little bit on that, because I think <laughs> if we want to understand what psychedelics do in the brain, uh, mm -hmm. we could use like complementary research in humans and mm -hmm. animal. Okay. Also, we ourselves have a close collaboration with Mark Geyer in San Diego. He does a number of uh, animal studies with psychedelics since 25 years. He's well known in, in the field here in the US. There are other people like George Akajani at Yale, does a lot of electrophysiology. Uh, Ron Griffiths, they do now humans, but uh, John Crystal, there's a lot of uh, ketamine work and I think MDMA a little bit now. You can do in animals, you can study components or genetic stuff, like we used animals to study the intracellular signaling. You can't do that in the human yet, it's not possible. But if you have that, you go back to the human. For instance, very easy, uh, the only sign behavioral pharmacologists have that the animal may hallucinate this, this head shake, but they believed that for years. And we have shown and others that you can induce the head shake, you don't, use a, you don't need a hallucinogen, you need glutamate to put in the brain and the animal makes like this. So when it comes to a higher cognitive processing or something like very complex, like an ego, a self, a construct of I and you, then forget the animal. And when it comes to thought is other, forget it. I don't believe in all that. So I believe in the pharmacology and the very detailed stuff you can do in animals, but I don't think you can extrapolate from animals to the humans. You can look at certain for instance, uh, psychedelics can facilitate uh, the memory, uh, going back in memory. How does this work? You can do something in the animal, look how, how, how is the hippocampus involved. But then you have to go back to the human. That's my convention. Yes? Hi. 
um, in your experiment when you're using LSD, um, at what stage do you put the hair in it on the patient? Is it before you give them administered LSD or in the middle? And how long are they under that analysis, under the um, positron or For MRI? Instance, positron. Uh, first of all, we, we haven't done LSD of the Dietrich because it takes so long, the experiment. We, we crunch down most of the experiments to psilocybin or other stuff. Or nowadays, we have derivatives of psilocybin, little analogs that uh, even are shorter, four hours or so. Uh, in the scanner, uh, for the brain waves, it takes us for an interesting experiment, like the conscious-subconscious discrimination, takes us about 15 minutes. And uh, for the PET scan, it takes one minute. And the fMRI depends on the experiment you make, 15 20 minutes. Then we go out of that, of that because subjects are not that much uh, motivated to go on into the experiments too long, and then they have time for listening to music or doing what they want, just in a nice room. Um, in your studies, you were showing that uh, psilocybin works to deactivate the hi hippocampus and that, of course, results in some of the positive subjective experiences of disassociating explicit memories from your, um, your experience with reality in the heightened front, frontal lobe area. But I was curious if you had explored um, total anesthetization of the hippocampus um, during these experiences, and maybe even without psilocybin, if uh, if you were to anesthetize the hippocampal region, if you would benefit or have similar subjective experiences of a dissocia dissociation of, mm -hmm. the, uh, of the ego. Uh, what we found is, uh, I didn't speak about that, in parallel, the same subjects got ketamine, different doses, and this ketamine you completely block out, you knock out the hippocampus, and you have, in fact, memory problems in terms, you have problems to access memory, and even the immediate time experience goes much more down than the psilocybin, is that just floating somewhere. And also you, you lose your personality as a uh, relation to reality much stronger with increasing dose of ketamine, and it's exactly what you are asking, that if you knock out the hippocampus, you cut down the relationship to, to your past. Okay. One last question then, please. The question of whether the, the type of experience that people have was structured by evolution sort of in the way that our language acquisition device was structured, uh, or whether it's something that's serendipitous where certain brain agencies are turned on and certain, certain ones are turned off, and it produces an interesting effect that we then interpret in, in certain ways, or that like nature favored tribes that had shamans, and so it evolved a special state that would be dormant most of the time, but then would be activated by these compounds and a, an experience that was honed to have certain properties. Uh, I, I mean, maybe that, maybe that requires research that hasn't been done. I, I don't know if, if your brain scans would shed any light on that. Um, when yeah. The, uh, okay, that's very short. <laughs> uh, the only thing I know from uh, going to these historical findings, at least in Europe, they think uh, it can be crunched down to the uh, about 100,000 year first findings in that they have must have been used. There were some uh, mummies or mummies found, they found some, and they found also kind of active uh, compounds in their uh, food, what they could uh, extract. If you go back in evolution, you can speculate that serotonin came into biology through the fungi because these magic mushrooms People speak only about psilocybin, but most of them, at least the European ones, they also have serotonin. 
And we know, for instance, that other cells we have in the body may have come from outside, like the mitochondria. So when that happened, I don't know. Okay. Well, please help me thank Franz Wollenweider.